<laughs> this morning we looked at the necessity of reaching out to others. The idea of evangelism, and it is only fitting that we go ahead and go a little bit deeper into the subject because evangelism is not easy. It is not something that you are able to just jump into and have a multitude of success. In fact, one of the number one reasons that people become discouraged is because though they feel that they are doing the work, the reality is they feel like there's no, nothing to see. That they have no progress. They have nothing to show for everything they've done. Evangelism is difficult. Look around you. I mean, right, right now, just look around. We had 58 people here this morning, and yet we have less than half of that this evening. That is the difficulty of evangelism. That is the difficulty that we face. That is part of what discourages people. It's one of the main reasons that ministers quit the ministry. Because they feel that what they're doing amounts to nothing. But what we need to understand is that when we feel this way, when we are struggling and we see that things aren't going the way we want them to go, the matter of the fact simply is, this is the way of the world. Go ahead and turn with me to Matthew chapter 13. In Matthew 13, starting in verse 3, Jesus opens up a parable. He says, Behold, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside. And the birds came and devoured them. Some fell in stony places where they did not have much earth, and they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them. But others fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has an ear, let him hear. Now, there's a little bit of back and forth between the people and Jesus after he provides this parable. And his disciples come and they actually ask some questions. And a little bit later, we get one of the greatest things. We get Jesus explaining his own parable. Jesus does not always take the opportunity to break down the parables. Sometimes we are left to discern the meaning ourselves. But with this particular parable, Jesus takes the time to sit his disciples down. And he says, here, let me tell you what this parable means. Let me break it down for you so that you understand exactly what I'm telling you. And in verse 18, Jesus says, therefore, hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who receives seed by the wayside. But he who received the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. Now he who receives seed among the thorns is he who hears the world, and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becomes unfruitful. But he who receives seed on the good ground is he who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Jesus, in this parable, tells us that there are four types of people. One receives the word and produces fruit. 25% can be reasonably assumed to heed your message. 75% will fall by the wayside. Some will hear it and receive it. They'll accept it. They'll be glad. They'll love it. They'll be happy. And then for various reasons, persecution, cares of the world, a lack of actual biblical knowledge, 
Whatever the reason is, something will happen and they will be pulled away. They will turn back to the world. They will reject what they've understood. And this is what Peter said is worse for those because it'd been better if they never received it. That's what Peter's talking about. These who received the word knew what they needed to do. And yet because of tribulation, because of their own personal desires, because of something that's going on in the world, they say, you know what? I'm going to leave. This is what the Hebrew author is trying to prevent, to stop this going back into the world. 50% that's where they fall. 25% when they hear the word they will just reject it out of hand. They don't care. They're not interested. They don't want to hear it. You throw your seed out and they say yeah you can just go ahead and keep on going. We don't care. And every single one of us knows someone like that. Every single one of us has probably talked to someone who has given us that exact message. I don't care. Seventy-five percent will reject the word of God out of hand through either a direct and immediate, I don't care, or an eventual, this is too hard for me, I have something that's more important. But who are they rejecting? You know, in the book of Samuel, Samuel is mad. In 1 Samuel, he he is absolutely, you you can tell he's infuriated. Uh, There's very few times you can read the Bible and you can actually get the emotion of an individual. But Samuel, you, you can see it. He is mad because the people are demanding that he make them a king. Now, in doing so, they are rejecting his sons. They are rejecting the the judges system that God had put in place. And Samuel, he's upset about it. What does God tell him? Do as they've said because they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me that I should not be king over them. People, we need to understand that when people when they refuse to accept the word of God, it is not a direct insult to us. We cannot take it personally. And that's hard. That's really upsetting sometimes. But they are not rejecting us. It is God that they are rejecting. I have really good friends. I have people who would give me the shirt off their back, but if I try to tell them about Christ, if I try to tell them about the church, they just assume I fall into a hole. They do not care. It has nothing to do with me. It has nothing to do with my ability to talk with them. The reality is they have rejected God. The Bible tells us Broad is the way that leads to destruction. For every individual that accepts the gospel, there will be many who reject it. Jesus teaches us that the idea is quite simple. If they hate you, rejoice. Why? Because they hated me first. I want you to consider that. Really, really think about that. Jesus, the Son of God, walked this earth. He taught the Word of God at such a point that by 12 years old, the rabbis, the teachers, were astonished at his knowledge and understanding. As he grew older, they were astonished that he taught not as a lawyer, not as a teacher, but as someone with authority. They were amazed. They would quit even questioning him because they, every time they questioned him, they were, well, they were silenced. As we see the final week of Jesus' life, he goes into Jerusalem riding on the back of a donkey to people yelling, shouting, screaming, Hosanna! And a few days later, That very crowd 
went from yelling, Hosanna, long live the king, to crucify him. Let's just kill our king. If they reject the Son of God, if they reject the greatest teacher, the greatest healer, the greatest physician, the greatest shepherd, if they reject the King of kings, the Lord of lords, understand that you will be rejected on occasions. Understand that people will show you hatred. People will show you disdain. People will ignore the word of God. Why? Have you ever been in a dark room? I do it to my kids all the time, and I feel so bad. In fact, I've gotten to where when I go into the room, I unscrew a couple of their light bulbs before I turn the light on. You ever been in a dark room and you flip the switch on and suddenly your, your eyes, they have it adjusted and you're like, ah! It's so bright. Well, it probably doesn't help I put daylight bulbs in every single room in my house. It's as bright as you can get. Brothers and sisters, when we tell individuals in the world about the gospel of Christ, we are shining a light in their darkness and they are screaming in hatred and in pain. Darkness cannot stand the light. And when we tell someone, this is what God would have you to do, God loves you, God cares about you, we are basically pouring salt on an open wound. Now, some will absolutely accept it. They'll realize that they'll be pricked in the heart, such as in Acts chapter 2. Peter, standing before them, he approaches this crowd and he tells them, this is what you have done. This is what your fathers have done. This is the reality of your situation. You have crucified. The same man that you have crucified, God has made both king and savior. <clears throat> their darkness was, was great and Peter took a flashlight and shined it right in their eyes and the response of 3,000 was we need to change but have you ever stopped to wonder how many people were in Jerusalem for Pentecost let me give you a hint it was a magnitude far greater than 3,000. Jews from every corner of the world entered into Jerusalem to celebrate Pentecost. It was the most important, one of their most significant festivals. You had to go. You had to be there. Tens of thousands of Jewish men and women were in Jerusalem celebrating Pentecost, and yet we're told only 3,000 heeded the gospel of Christ and were baptized. What about Paul? Paul is a great example of an individual who we're told, we looked at it this morning, he said, I have taken every opportunity And yet, in one of his letters, he would write, Demas has forsaken me. Here is an apostle of our Lord. Here is someone who is living the very idea of repentance. He is a living example of what you have to do. You persecute Christianity. You deny the Christ. Now he is out there actively every single day proclaiming who Christ is. And yet we see that people withstood him to his face, that he was shipwrecked, that he was beaten, that he was betrayed, that he suffered greatly. Was it because of Paul? Was Paul somehow a, just a horrible person? No. What he proclaimed was a message that no one wanted to hear. It was a message in which he told them, repent, turn, change, go back to God. Think 
of what we see when we turn through the pages of the Bible. Think of Israel taken out of Egyptian captivity, traveling a short little distance and then crying out, oh, you've brought us out here to die. Over and over and over, we see these four types of people. We see the people who, when the, difficult, when the situation gets difficult, they say, oh, well, you know what, I'm out. We see the people who, when the opportunity arises to do something that's all so great and fun, they want to jump on that and say, uh, God going to Disney World, God doing this, God, uh, sorry, God, I'll see you later. We see the people who will look you in the face and say, I just do not care. But then we have the people who, as Jesus clearly explains, they receive the word, they understand it, they bear fruit and produce some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. The idea being that we never know just how great our effort might be. The one person that you bring to the gospel of Christ, to the fold of Christ, that one person might end up being someone capable of reaching thousands. You do not know. And maybe it's not them. Maybe they live a faithful life. They strive to do what's necessary. They have a child who again does, and then they have another. Maybe that grandchild grows up to becoming a gospel preacher who can reach untold thousands. We never know what impact we have and we should never sell ourselves short. We should never look at what we have done, look at the lives we have lived and say, I'm just not doing enough. If you are not actively evangelizing, you are not doing enough. If you are not proclaiming the word of God, you are not doing enough. If you are doing that and you feel that you are not having any luck, and that is on those who have rejected the word of God. That is not on you. Jesus, when sending out his disciples for the limited commission, he tells them, when you go out, if a city rejects you, kick the dust off your feet. Why? Because Jesus knew they reject me, they're going to reject you. Jesus knew that the, the mindset of humanity is to reject Christ. There are four types of people. Three reject God. One bears fruit. We have example after example after example of individuals, great, wonderful, powerful individuals, people who are capable and able of doing astounding things in the name of God, and yet they are rejected. They come for the wrong reasons. Jesus feeding the thousands. They came to eat and then they left. Jesus healing the multitudes. They came for the healing and then they left. In all that we do is we often point out we must give God the glory. Paul would say, I planted, Apollos watered, but it is God who gave the increase. God is in control. God is who looks into the heart of an individual. God is who is capable and able to produce results in the hearts of men. No orotating skills of mine will save a single soul. It is the gospel that is the power of salvation. And as long as we present the gospel purely, simply, and with love in our hearts, nothing that results from that is either to our credit 
of two archangels. There is difficulty in evangelism. It's disheartening. It can make you cry. It can make you want to give up. But we have to remember the simple truth. They rejected the Son of God. And he tells us, if they have rejected me, surely they will reject you. Let us never forget the truth of that difficulty. Let us never become discouraged by what we see as a failure to achieve results. Instead, let us steadfast, let us continue as Christ would have us to do. Let us reach out and proclaim the gospel to each and every one. Let us follow the Great Commission in Matthew 28, 19 through 20. Let us go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Let us go into all nations. Take the gospel with you wherever you go, and you are fulfilling the command of Christ that he is well pleased with you. And never doubt the worth of your contribution, for you never know what small part, what large part you might have had in staring someone to the God, to the God our, our Lord. This evening, if you're here and you feel discouraged, if you feel that you have not been able to accomplish what you need to, I encourage you, don't give up. You are not alone in your feelings of, of discouragement. You are not alone in your feelings of inadequacy. Everyone has been there. And if you haven't been there, then likelihood is, well, are you trying? Can we pray for you? Can we encourage you? Can we help you? If we can do anything for you, now is the time. As we stand, as we sing. Jesus is the early calling, the Lord.